This video is brought to you by my amazing patrons. If you want to help support me make more videos like this one, then you can join my Patreon by using the link in the description. If you've been anywhere near the gay superhero fan area of the internet in the past few weeks, you've probably seen the accusations of queer baiting levelled at Marvel's show Falcon and the Winter Soldier. To recap, there's two characters, Bucky and Sam, have the kind of back and forth banter that runs a fine line between buddy comedy and the straight people trope of heterosexuals who hate each other are actually just really attracted to each other. In the second episode in particular, they end up rolling around on top of each other in a field after a fight and landing pressed chest to chest, a trope we've actually seen in other Marvel movies to denote romantic or sexual tension. This is then followed by a scene where they get literal marriage counselling together, doing exercises to help lovers figure out what kind of life they are trying to build together, and a soul gazing exercise where they have to stare into each other's eyes and get so close that their thighs interlinked. We also had, spotted by a lot of people who look at men's profiles on dating apps, can't relate, the strange little comment from Bucky in the first episode, when on a date with a woman he mentions that dating apps are weird because of the tiger pictures. Tiger pics are notoriously a thing on men's dating profiles. There's even an entire Tumblr dedicated to Tinder guys with tigers. The reference to tigers is so specific that it would be truly bizarre to not have been deliberate. It feels like Marvel are very aware that they're playing into what a lot of people want to see around representation in the show while not actually confirming anything, and that is the literal definition of queer baiting. And this reading of queerness didn't just come from nowhere. Bucky was based on two characters from the Marvel comics, the original Bucky, but also Arnie Roth, Steve Rogers' childhood best friend. As writer Eileen Gonzalez explains, he and Steve Rogers grew up together during the Depression. Arnie, being bigger and stronger, protected his fragile friend from bullies. The two frequently double dated, with Arnie much more enthusiastic about it than skinny wallflower Stevie. Arnie knew Steve so well that he was able to recognise his old friend even behind the mask and bulk of Captain America, exactly like Bucky. Oh, and also, Arnie Roth was canonically gay. It feels a little gross to me to deliberately add these romance-coded moments in a show about a character whose sexuality has been speculated on for a while now, especially from a studio that's notoriously given us no real representation in the past. But don't worry, we'll get into that a little later in the video. I didn't just want to talk about this one particular show today, because this link between queerness and superheroes goes so far beyond that. Superheroes currently dominate the blockbuster and movie fandom landscapes, and provide aspirational heroes and role models to many, especially young people. It's a genre of cinema that ties together themes of transformation, duality, identity, and explores the experience of having to hide your true self in plain sight, and the potential consequences of coming out. It's not that superheroes can be queer, honestly it's that they're fundamentally queer. People who feel different from the rest of the population, forced to live secret lives, scared of being outed, dressed in skin-tight lycra, that's gay, baby. So why the hell does Hollywood hate gay superheroes so much? Let's find out together. So before we begin, I'm just going to give you some of my qualifications for talking about this topic. I know that the charge of fake geek girl is something that's still bandied around the internet. So, um, <laughs> number one, one of my most popular videos is an unhinged one-take rant that definitively proves that Captain Marvel is gay. Two, the fact that I worked as a dramaturg on an extremely short-lived queer theatre show in 2013. And number three, I genuinely might have read every Stucky fic ever written. I can only hope that that will be enough. This video also includes a special guest segment from my friend, YouTuber, and Marvel fanboy, Cory, whose qualifications include the literal hours of excited voice my mostly sent me when WandaVision was coming out every single week. So let's get into it. Why is it important? Superhero movies are primarily about heroism in all its forms, from the Hitler punching soldier to the friendly neighborhood crime fighter. They run the spectrum of what it is to be someone fighting for good, often on a cosmic or apocalyptic level. Even anti-heroes and vigilantes, however questionable their methods, ultimately end up helping save the day. In a way, these superhero characters are the mythology of today. In a similar way to the stories of the pantheons of ancient Rome or Greece, they're epic tales of morality, which we can map onto our own lives. Although underground scenes and homemade comics crafted by marginalised creators have long been portraying queer superhero characters outside of mainstream media and oversight, their impact is less culture shifting and more localised, often reaching those already invested in the idea of representation. If we want to talk about the power of stories with a wider impact, we need to be talking about Marvel and DC, whose movies dominate the box office and cultural landscape at large. So what happens when you have a group who is conspicuously left out of this kind of modern myth-making? When we look at these ideas of who heroes are and who is missing? How might that affect the real people from those groups and the attitudes towards those groups by others? We've seen with the release of movies like Black Panther and Wonder Woman the potential positive impact this kind of representation can have, especially on young people. We break away from the idea that the brave, heroic, and powerful are white men by default. The Code 
So if queer representation is so important, why haven't we got it in superhero movies already? I hear you cry. Well, step back in my metaphorical time machine and let's have a look. If you've watched any of my videos about queer representation before, you have almost certainly heard of the Hayes Code. It was a self-imposed period of censorship by Hollywood that actually prohibited movies from portraying queer characters. But what if I told you that the comic book industry had the same gosh darn idea. Let me introduce you to the wonderful world of the Comic Code Authority. The code was created in 1954 after a heavily publicised United States Senate subcommittee investigation into the supposed links between comic books and juvenile delinquency and moral decay. Much like the Hayes Code before it, this was also self-imposed by the industry, attempting to get ahead of any government oversight. Stores wouldn't risk carrying comics that didn't contain the literal seal of approval from the code. Psychiatrists by the name of Frederick Wortham wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent, which argued that the lifestyles and actions depicted in comic books at the time was influencing children, specifically influencing them to lives of delinquency. In terms of queer content, he ironically made some of the strongest first arguments for superheroes being like really gay. He claimed Wonder Woman's strength and independence portrayed her as a lesbian, and famously stated that only someone ignorant of the fundamentals of psychiatry and the sociopathy of sex can fail to realise a subtle atmosphere of homoeroticism which pervades the adventures of the nature of black man and his young friend Robin. Wortham himself spoke at that Senate subcommittee and actually testified that comic books were a major cause of juvenile crimes, although there was wasn't any scientific validity to his claims, which included stats like over 90% of children in reform schools read comics, which is a clear case of correlation not equaling causation, it caught the imagination of those in power. As Stanley has pointed out, Wortham said things that impressed the public. Because he had the name Doctor, people took what he was saying seriously and it started a whole crusade against comics. Some points from the code that related to queer representation specifically included violent love scenes as well as sexual abnormalities are unacceptable. The treatment of love romance stories shall emphasise the value of home and the sanctity of marriage. Sex perversion or any inference to the same is strictly forbidden. Ironically, it was this emphasis on the corruption of children to the general public that solidified the idea that comics were primarily for children. This, along with the homosocial emphasis by Wortham of the Batman comics, played into the homophobic association of gay men and paedophiles. When the comics showed Batman and his ward Dick Grayson in twin beds lying side by side, it now implied something much more sinister than intended. By tying together the ideas of violent love scenes and sexual abnormalities into one phrase, the implication of homosexuality and violence as inherently linked was clear. Ironically, often this idea of men going to fight crime together was specifically written to adhere to the standard ideas of gender at the time where women were less likely to be portrayed as superheroes. As scholar Susanna Mondal put it, even if the male hero had a steady girlfriend, he was constantly leaving her alone to dress up in costume, run off and have adventures, usually in an all-male space of crime and combat. The queer readings truly write themselves. And the queer readings were also written by other people, like the writers at SNL who created the famous ambiguously gay duo sketch about cartoon superheroes Ace and Gary, who were extremely heavily coded to be gay, while also being obvious stand-ins for existing classic superhero duos. The sketch involved lots of anal jokes, the villains gossiping about Gary and Ace's relationship, and Ace constantly patting Gary on the arse and asking, what's everyone looking at? The humour in this sketch essentially hinged on the idea of existing queer readings of superheroes that everyone in the audience, except for the superheroes themselves, were aware of. It wasn't until 1989 that the Comics Code was finally revised to include homosexuals on a list of recognisable national, social, political, cultural, ethnic and racial groups that must be portrayed in a positive light. It's over 30 years of comic book history and mythos in which gay characters were deliberately left out of the canon. And even after the code was officially lifted, there was still a hesitation. While supporting characters were sometimes seen with partners, gay superheroes were not. The 90s series Gen 13 featured Rainmaker openly talking about her attraction to women, but the artists were told she could only kiss women on the cheek and not on the lips. And while X Factor team members Shatterstar and Richter first appeared in the 80s, they didn't actually kiss until 2009. It was the first same-sex kiss in Marvel history. Queer coding. Ah, queer coding, my old friend. We meet again. Basically, queer coding is using elements of the characters, the way they dress, speak, act, for example, which are traditionally linked to queerness in a character who isn't explicitly canonically queer. We also have romance coding, characters who seem like they have a romantic potential based on the ideas of romance that we've seen on screen before, the music in the background, the language they use around their relationship for each other, the way they physically interact, 
the narrative surrounding them, this can all contribute to setting up the expectation of a romantic pairing. It's the same kind of implied stuff that got Wortham so worked up in the first place. If even heterosexuals can spot it, then you can bet that us queers did too. The Lego Batman movie is pretty aggressive in the way it queer codes the relationship between Batman and the Joker. It shows us Harley giving Joker the you're too good for him speech, Batman and Joker say things to each other like, you're trying to entrap me into a relationship, and I'm fine with you fighting other people. It's signposted to obviously be an extended joke throughout the movie, rather than a totally serious piece of representation, but when you're so starved of representation at all, like, I'll take it. Like, no, no, you put this in here yourselves. You did this. Joker is gay for Batman. I'm just picking up what you're putting down, big Lego. Especially because this idea of Batman and the Joker having a particular connection is nothing new. Miller's version of the pair sets up the Joker as queer coded in his use of makeup, his pet names for Batman, and by sending them through a literal tunnel of love ride in the climactic scene. Plus giving Batman this interesting inner monologue while it happens. Can you see it, Joker? Feels to me like it's written all over my face. I've lain awake nights, planning it, picturing it, endless nights, considering every possible method, treasuring each imaginary moment. From the beginning, I knew that there's nothing wrong with you that I can't fix with my hands. <laughs> I mean. The Joker's obsession with Batman is like classic queer coded villain territory. This obsession makes him bad, which makes him kill, which makes him evil, thus the evil and the queer obsession are linked. But we also have queer coding in good characters too. The character of Arnie Roth that I mentioned earlier, one of the inspirations for the MCU's Bucky Barnes, is one such character. At first his representation was coded rather than overt. Arnie meets Steve again after decades apart and explains that he never married because it never seemed right but that he's found happiness in the company of his best friend and roommate, Michael. Hmm. Later, we get this really honestly messed up scene after Zemo captures Arnie, forces him to dress in stage makeup, and then basically give a speech about why his love for Michael is wrong, saying things like, my name is Arnold Roth, I prance and pout, I scream and shout, my taste is not quite right, calling himself a pot-bellied, bald-headed wretch who doesn't know a thing about real human love. No wonder the Nazis wanted my kind, the weak, the misfits, locked away in the concentration camps with the other pariahs. I'm a menace to society, a disease. And you, star-spangled idiot, you call me friend. What does that say about you? Most people simply hate men like me, yet you always treated me with respect, compassion. Why? Was it because you're one of us? Is it because deep inside, under all that macho bravado, you're really a sorry excuse for a man like me. Arnie couldn't use the word gay or be officially confirmed canonically queer at the time, but it's pretty damn obvious. And subsequent biographies and canonical writings about the character have confirmed that he is gay. Coming out. The coming out metaphor is one of the clearest parallels between superheroes and real life queer experiences. Superheroes have this tension between the public and private self. Secret identities, fear of revealing their true selves to the ones they love, questioning is it safe to tell this person? Are there consequences to not telling them? Who is the real me? Superhero media is full of forceful and joyful identity proclamations where the hero goes through a process of self-discovery and then comes out the other side able to say, I am Iron Man, or who am I? I'm Spider-Man. Mutants especially have such a perfect potential in this reading because their powers often manifest in their teen years, much like many queer people discovering their sexuality during puberty. In the X-Men movie X2, there is a whole scene where Bobby comes out to his parents as a mutant. The scene plays out exactly as you would expect a teen coming out movie scene to. When did you know? Parents not able to even say the word mutant. We still love you, it's just even, have you tried not being a mutant? It's clearly meant to be a tongue-in-cheek reference to sexuality. Even having this scene play out with a group of other mutants in the room with him supporting him feels like a parallel to the idea of queer found family and support you can find in the community, even as other people shun you. But they didn't actually allow any of the mutants themselves to be openly gay. It's honestly the height of irony about the fact that his, like, his girlfriend in the scene is rogue, and then later Bobby himself would also come out in the comics. The X-Men comics have had multiple storylines where this kind of metaphor is really pushed to its limits. Storylines where TV critics talk about, you know, changing the stereotypical portrayals of mutants on TV and movies, using the language around HIV to discuss mutant experiences, like when Jean Grey announced Charles Xavier discovered he was X-Gene positive one day at the end of August 30 years ago in a story where Charles decides to out himself as a mutant in a kind of political act, which also calls back to the political coming out movement that was encouraged by Harvey Milk. 
In the Daredevil story arc, appropriately titled Out, Matt Murdock finds his secret identity revealed in the news, and he has a choice between confirming or denying it. A journalist insists to editor J. Jonah Jameson, this isn't news, outing someone, it's not news, it's an assassination, this is the life of a good, decent person. Like, it's so obviously a parallel. Interestingly, the first lesbian superhero in mainstream comics, Kate Kane's Batwoman, who first appeared in 2006, had an outing storyline with a queer focus. Her comic book origin story revolves around being kicked out of the army under the homophobic don't ask, don't tell policy. Her relationship with a woman is discovered, and although she's given the opportunity to lie, to continue on in the force, she can't do it, and instead she confirms that she's gay. Allegory. One of the most exciting and interesting things about science fiction and fantasy and superheroes for me is its allegory potential. You can have all the complexity of the ordinary drama, romance, or comedy, but with an added layer of social commentary on top, when done well. Oftentimes in comic history, allegory is used as a replacement for actual queer representation with mixed results. Take, for example, the X-Men and Mutants. Stanley himself said that the X-Men were a good metaphor for what was happening in the civil rights movement of the country at the time. They were created in the 60s and clearly paralleled ideas of systemic and systematic persecution. And it wasn't just mutants versus humans or mutants and humans versus some great enemy, but instead looked at the ways in which mutants themselves disagreed about what to do to fight their persecution. X-Men storylines include anti-mutant laws and registrations that would control what mutants were and weren't allowed to do. It's not a huge leap to see how the same ideas can be used in a queer reading of the story. In the aforementioned X2 movie, we can see this simmering so close to the surface. The villain Stryker has this kind of standing conversion therapy storyline where he hopes that his son will get rid of his powers by going to Professor X. Stryker sees mutant powers as a disease. It feels very much like a father sending his son to pray the gay away. But it also shows that his son was dangerous and deliberately driving his mother mad, so the parallels break down a little there. Sometimes the gaps and allegories can do more harm than good. We also have comic book storylines like God Loves, Man Kills, where the X-Men are threatened by a powerful Christian preacher. He believes mutants are creations not of God but of the devil, whose existence is an affront to the Lord. This use of religious bigotry in scripture to argue against mutants' very existence is unfortunately something that I think a lot of queer people can relate to over the world even today. Marvel also took inspiration from queer tragedy with the introduction of the legacy virus, a clear stand-in for HIV and AIDS, which specifically affected mutants. The virus would disrupt healthy cell regeneration and gradually lead to death. The parallels were numerous, from the mutant plague mirroring the gay plague rhetoric of the 80s, to the conspiracy theories about the virus being man-made, and an increased fear and hatred of mutants that it caused. Real-life accusations of homophobia stalling effective treatment for HIV and AIDS is also mirrored when the cure to the legacy virus is found shortly after the first infection of a human character, Moira, giving the impression that there's not a rush to find a cure until normal people are in danger. The moral dilemma of the Civil War stories of both the MCU and the comics can also be seen to parallel real-life marginalised community concerns, mainly assimilation versus freedom. Iron Man backs a bill supporting a registry for people with powers that creates a rift between the superheroes with different opinions about whether this is a reasonable way of keeping harm from being done with government oversight, or having the potential for governments to control them to use them for their own ends. Giving registries of certain groups infringing on their rights to move freely, it's not exactly been a recipe for justice, historically speaking. Critic Gareth Scott points out, previously autonomous and ungoverned superhero activity would shift heroism itself from the codes of moral justice to that of the law. If you don't view the law as inherently just, then you might have a problem with that. And before this, Marvel gave us a similar ethical question with the Federal Mutant Registration Act storyline of the 1980s. Promotional posters were created which depicted Marvel characters urging the mutants amongst readers to sign on to the government registry. The advertising campaign around the plotline included stark images of mutant persecution with faces of children across some of which was written muty. The poster reading, it's 1987, do you know what your children are? Some of the issues with allegories like this have been recently pointed pointed out in the critique of Disney's animated movie Zootopia. Does the allegory of persecution work when one group is literally dangerous, especially if they are a stand-in for people of colour in this metaphor? Especially when a drug introduced into the predator community by a pro-supremacist is making the predators savage and dangerous? 
using actual animals where predators who in reality are dangerous and literally kill and eat prey, it feels like a lot for a Disney animated movie to be tackling, you know? Allegories often have holes that don't stand up to scrutiny because they aren't direct matches of what they are commenting on. Similarly, persecuted groups in reality and superpowered people in fiction are fundamentally different. When someone can level a city block with a wave of their hand, having some kind of legal record of them might seem reasonable. It maybe mutes the critique you might be making of the acceptability of this kind of registration in real life. Queer as folk and rage. There are ways of having both queer characters and allegorical or exaggerated queer elements within the same piece of media. One absolutely iconic show for this is Queer as Folk. The central character, Michael, is a gay man who loves comic books. He ends up running his own comic book store, and alongside other character, Justin, creates a successful gay superhero comic, Rage. Rage's storyline utilised the extreme scenarios of superheroes and villains to create reflections on real gay life. The inspiration behind the character came from a couple of different sources, including Michael's frustration at a queer code character Captain Astro being killed off in his favourite comic series, and Justin's complex feelings about the powerlessness he felt after a gay bashing. Rage's powers include healing people through sex, a clear comment on the demonisation of queer men's sex lives, and the characterisation as predators, as well as the homophobic attitudes to HIV over the decades. Rage is exactly what he sounds like, a product of queer anger at injustice in a heteronormative society. Story editor Brad Fraser explained it really well. When you do start exploring gay rage or queer anger, the straight audience becomes very uncomfortable with it, and I'd argue the gay audience does as well. I don't know if that's because we have so much rage inside of us already that we're afraid to tap it, or as I'm told by some people, we can't let the straight world see that because if they do, they'll become scared of us again. The comic book is picked up for a Hollywood adaptation in the show, and they explore the issues with queer representation in a direct way. The Rage movie is cancelled because Justin is given the option to either stay true to their queer superhero vision or make him more palatable to a mainstream audience by making Rage straight. It's so exactly what we still see in Hollywood two decades later, it's kind of depressing. It's seen as too niche, too divisive, too queer. It's something the queerest folk writers saw all the time in their own experiences of entertainment. Michael McLennan saying, We were all in Hollywood. It was the one thing we were knowledgeable about. How everything we were putting out was being straightwashed. You turn the heads of people in power and they just shave up what's interesting, creatively. It's a tale as old as time, basically. Queer as folks' treatment of superheroes and comics and their importance and relevance to the queer community is such a lovely part of the show. There's this quote from Michael about superheroes that I absolutely love. Yet with all the villains and the monsters and the evil forces that are trying to destroy them, somehow they survive. I believe the same about us. That's what the comics have shown me, that despite everything, we'll survive and we'll win. But uh, back to the guys in tights. It's a classic mix of genuine emotional resonance with tongue-in-cheek camp that's characterised so many superheroes over the years. Queer fan family. Here I'm going to pass over to Cory to talk about one of the potential shining lights in future queer representation on screen, The Young Avengers. Thank you for that very kind intro, Rowan. I assume I haven't actually seen your video yet. So I'm going to use my time on Rowan's channel today to get up on my Marvel soapbox and tell you about my absolute favourite superhero team because I think they're one of the best examples of LGB and unfortunately to a much lesser extent T representation in the media. Also because I don't think Rowan wants me sending her any more voice notes about them. <laughs> Anyway, The Young Avengers is a relatively recent addition to the Marvel Comics canon. They were created in 2005 by a fantastic artist Jim Chung and Alan Heinberg, an openly gay man. You might know Alan better as the screenwriter for 2017's Wonder Woman, or as a writer-producer on shows like Sex and the City, Gilmore Girls, Grey's Anatomy, and The O.C. Interestingly, it was his work on The O.C. that got him the big Marvel gig. There was a character on the show that he injected his love of comics into, and in an interview about that character, he just gushed about Marvel. When the interview got published, the editor-in-chief of Marvel, Joe Quesada, called him up and said, hey, do you want a job? It just goes to show you, if you gush about Marvel, it might just land you a gig. Hi, Mr. Kevin Feige, I love Marvel a lot. Rowan can tell you that I love Marvel a lot. I'll do anything, I'll be any character that you want me to be. I know you might be looking for an Iron Lad here. I have credentials as being Iron Man. You can see that. Maybe you want to hire me. You can give me a job, I'll be anyone. Thank you very much. Anyway, Alan Heinberg created the Young Avengers with the idea that each character would be a parallel to or have some connection with a member of the big boy Avengers. So let's speed through this. The first incarnation of the team had Iron Lad, Patriot, Wiccan, Speed, Hulkling, Stature, and Hawkeye, but the girl one. Even with just the names and costumes, the connections to each Avenger should be fairly obvious. The first incarnation is great, they are a load of fun, 
But at the time of the comic coming out, the only ones that had come out themselves were Wiccan and Hulkling. Objectively, Marvel's best couple. Although, while their budding relationship wasn't completely subtextual, as one fan put it in a letter to their writer, it's there for those that want to see it, but completely ignorable for those that don't. So you're probably asking what sets this team apart from any other show, book, or movie that has a couple of gays in it. Well, first off, Teddy and Billy are individuals. They're not carbon copies of each other. They're not stereotypically gay characters. Characters. They're just two guys that are in a relationship and the drama comes from other parts of their lives. And for 2005, this was so refreshing. You gotta remember that gay characters in comics up until this point had pretty much mostly been used to tackle the big gay issues of the time. Either that or their sexual orientation was pretty much entirely ambiguous. And I think Alan Heinberg says it best in his 2011 interview with the Gay Times. While they're open about their sexuality and relationship, they're by no means defined by it. In my opinion, any superhero who's primarily defined by his or her sexuality doesn't make for a very interesting or multi-dimensional superhero. Or a human being for that matter. Now this was pretty big for 2005, but with 2021 vision it still feels kind of lacking to me. It still kind of falls into the only gay in the village trope. There are two gay men on the team and they're dating each other. Don't get me wrong, this is still leagues ahead of what we get even today in some cases, but it can be kind of limiting. If you only have two gay men as your LGBT rep, you're limited in the aspects and experiences of queerness that you can explore. And on top of that, anything that you do explore will run the risk of being seen as an example of the entire community. Kieran Gillen's 2013 run of the Young Avengers really switched that up, and I think these pages pretty succinctly explain why. This series is pretty groundbreaking, at least in my opinion. Here we've got a brilliant run of comics that puts fantastic superhero action alongside dealing with coming of age, relationship problems, gay drama, coming out, and all of these other problems that teenagers actually have to face, all without phoning it in by just setting it in a high school. There were a few changes to the team, so let's just run through the new one so we've got an idea of the diversity that we've got going on here. We still have our beautiful gay boy friends Wiccan and Hulkling, but joining them this time around is America Chavez, a super strong lesbian with two mums and the ability to kick portals into other dimensions. Marvel Boy, a music-loving alien who is bi or pan by virtue of him being from another world, but who also seems to have a really strong preference for the ones that look like women. Kate Barton, token straight friend who's currently knocking boots with Marvel Boy. Kid Loki, the arguably gender-fluid, definitely bisexual god of mischief who's been trapped in the body of his younger self and also can't seem to go five minutes without flirting with someone. Prodigy, an ex-mutant whose former ability to gain the knowledge and experience of those around him seems to have left him with a chronic case of bisexuality and a penchant for being an absolute disaster. And finally, Speed, who returns from the last run but this time round has given up being a part of the Young Avengers team and is batting for a different one. Don't get me wrong, this isn't absolutely perfect. They're still a mostly white, mostly male, almost entirely cis group, but it is a massive step in the right direction, one that is yet to be seen in most of mainstream media. One of the core reasons that I absolutely adore this team and see them as a shining example of LGBT rep is pretty simple. It's one of the only times in fiction that I've seen a queer friendship group being portrayed so realistically, without the story focusing entirely on their queerness or ignoring it to the point of it being subtextual. And I mean, let's be honest here, outside of fiction, how often do you really see a single queer person that hangs out with exclusively straight people. When you're queer, even if you don't know it yet, you somehow end up orbiting around other queer people. Example, you're in high school and you think you're straight, but then one of your friends comes out and you all support them, but then another one comes out and another one comes out, and by the time you finish uni, all of you are some flavor of L, G, B, or T, except for that one friend who is still, sadly, heterosexual. I don't know how it happens, but it happens. If you're not straight, chances are you'll probably end up hanging out with other not straight people. On top of this, there's an added layer of reality in the Young Avengers run because the boundaries between platonic and romantic get kind of blurry for some of the characters. This is an experience that is really common in queer friend groups. So often you see relationships that are difficult to classify based on the standards of other heteronormative relationships. Now this isn't fully explored in the book, but we do get some minor hints towards this kind of ambiguity. But, why is this so important to me? Representation in mainstream media nowadays pretty much starts and ends at showing that LGBTQ people exist and can sometimes even be pretty normal, actually. By just plopping a gay kid into a group of understanding but still mildly homophobic straight people or having a gay kid take his first steps into the queer world, you're missing out on so many queer experiences. And that's not to say that we shouldn't be telling those kinds of stories. They're all important in their own way. I just feel like we tend to only see 
those kinds of stories. We tend to only see these characters taking their first steps into queerness, or dealing with toxic relationships, or existing solely as a character to make queerness more palatable to straight people. Telling stories with characters like the Young Avengers is so important for queer people, because you can delve into stories that you wouldn't be able to delve into if you only had one or two gay characters. The quirks of queer friendships that just aren't present elsewhere. The interactions that are formed by that shared experience of queerness. Having representation is great, but if you're only representation is a character who's always the odd one out, then you're only representing the stories of isolated queer people. And with the world becoming more open and accepting, that is not the only experience. Conversely, if your only representation outside of the lone gay trope is a group of queer people whose identity is their entire story, then you're kind of in the same position. Only seeing representation that tells you you're the odd one out or that your life is entirely defined by your identity isn't really adequate representation. We have a massive lack of fiction that features multiple queer characters whose stories are informed by their identities rather than being entirely defined by it. And Young Avengers is one of the few works that does this really well, in my opinion. Thank you very much for listening to me. My hijacking of this video is now over and you can get back to listening to Rowan again. Queer Bodies and Camp Last year in an article on queerness and superheroes, Anna Peppard wrote, Themes are amplified by the queer deviance of superhero bodies, which routinely sprout sticky tentacles or fiery tendrils, merge with rock or metal, and liquefy, stretch, bend, or transform into a thousand different sexed and sexless shapes. Queer and trans bodies are often existing in opposition to hetero and cisnormative binaries. The visual metaphor for superhero body also feels rife for queer reading. Coming out is not so much of an issue for those heroes unable to hide their secret identities. Mutants like Nightcrawler with his indigo fur, yellow eyes and tail will always be read as a mutant. It feels like an obvious parallel to queer and trans people who don't pass as straight or cis. Scholar Mark Wade in his writing about Superman describes the tension of coming out as a superhero being seen as a sign of deceit and a cause of fear. He has superhuman powers and he's been keeping them a secret? That's a big secret. What else has he been keeping from them, they'd wonder. The possibilities would be endless, and some of them sinister. Again, this feels so apt as an example of the twisted logic that gave way to things like the trans and gay panic defences, where people who attacked LGBTQ plus people would defend themselves by claiming that they were the victims of deceitful and predatory practices by the victims. In a less depressing way, there's also a sense of queerness in much of superhero media, with over-the-top costumes and dramatic personas that is really compatible with the aesthetics of camp. Rubber and leather, BDSM-inspired outfits in bright colours, a sense of play and theatricality. In 1997, a reviewer of the film Batman Forever talked of close-ups of rubber butts and groins. If Batman and Robin regroup for a fifth caped crusade, expect the Dark Knight to confess to a lifelong passion for interior design. We can read between the lines here. Modern superhero media tends to steer away from the traditional camp aesthetic by taking itself a lot more seriously. Critic Susanna Mandel theorises, Perhaps due to the gradually increasing awareness of camp in the popular culture, and the reality of gay culture and gay people living beside and inside the mainstream, the flamboyance of superheroes seems to have become more vexed since the 1960s. In the early 1990s, Image Comics set the tone for a movement that turned men's costumes into ripped shirts and armoured exoskeletons, in a move evocative of the mid-80s Rambo and Predator aesthetics. It may have been an attempt to wrangle superheroes back into the rigid binaries of gender and straightness, but according to a lot of queer men growing up in that period, including my gay older brother, it maybe didn't have the heterosexual effect they were hoping for. Fanfiction and shipping Let's be real. Since the MCU became a thing and we first got to see the relationship between Steve and Bucky, Marvel has dominated the fanfiction space. It consistently has not one, but two ships in AO3's most popular ship top 10 lists, and the fandom at large is easily in the top 5 on the site. In fact, a 2019 survey about shipping that had 17,000 responses revealed that Stucky, Steve and Bucky, was the most popular ship of any fandom. If you were on the internet when the Avengers movie first came out, then you know the amount of fanfics that got written about the Avengers living together in Stark Tower as buddies. Then Winter Soldier gave us hurt, comfort and angst fix about Steve helping Bucky's recovery. For all that the MCU hates to show canonical queer characters, the fans sure do like to write them. I don't know, something about these two guys who protected and cared for each other from childhood, who would ignore orders during the Second World War so they could rescue each other from behind enemy lines, or go rogue and defy the authorities and half the Avengers to protect each other in the 21st century. It just feels like those dudes could be in love, you know? The iconic line, I'm with you to the end of the line, Basically the idea of being with someone forever, of sacrificing for them no matter what, of trusting them, of being loyal to them, it's the kind of line that would mean automatic romance potential between a man and a woman on screen, 
And yet, the MCU also has Captain Marvel and the extremely queer and romance-coded relationship between her and Maria. Again, I've done an entire video on this that I will leave in the description, but to summarise, in that movie, they are raising a child together, uh, Carol regains her lost memories by thinking about Maria in a classic romance trope, plus their storyline directly parallels a straight couple story, and yet they never come out and say it. It feels like a expected slap in the face that WandaVision confirmed that Maria is, in fact, dead, and they probably never saw each other again after the events of Captain Marvel. The lack of out queer characters in the MCU has left fans of the movies with little to work with below speculative ships. But I also think this point from scholar Gareth Scott is pretty telling too. Despite the surface of out gay superheroes, fans that take a queer reading of the comic text have persisted in their queering of straight characters due to the underdeveloped nature of mainstream comic treatments of queer performative identity. You can't just give people a bad or undercooked queer character and expect them to thank you for scraps. But it's been over 30 years since the code was revised. Why haven't we seen LGBTQ plus characters in mainstream superhero cinema since? Superhero cinema and blockbusters. The bigger the budget, the bigger the risk when it comes to representation, at least in the minds of Hollywood. Superhero movies by design are not cheap to make, often costing hundreds of millions of dollars. When the issue of queer representation is brought up, the logic goes, sure, we could do that, but what about China? Profits rather than any moral or social reasoning become the focus. But this excuse is not as clear cut as it seems, from both directions. For one, it's an easy way to let Western homophobia off the hook. It's easy to blame those backward Asian countries when there is plenty of corn-fed, homegrown, organic, anti-LGBTQ plus sentiment in the US of A. But also, in analysis work done by scholar Ellie Lockhart, she found, I believe I can say that my analysis proves this wrong. At least for big budget movies with LGBT major characters, regardless of genre, the international box office is a huge help. These films are not being punished abroad, and in some cases are actually doing better internationally. And then we have the same excuse that they gave back in the 50s. Why won't someone think of the children? Big summer superhero blockbusters, barring a couple of R-rated exceptions, are family movies, made to be suitable for children. Sadly, even now, the damaging myth of queer people being inappropriate for children's media continues and stops the industry from treating LGBTQ plus characters with the same potential as straight and cis ones. Famously, Spider-Man actor Andrew Garfield became a public supporter of a potentially bisexual version of Peter Parker, asking, why can't we discover that Peter is exploring his sexuality? Why can't he be into boys? And why can't Peter explore his bisexuality in the next film? Why can't MJ be a guy? And then later revealed that these hypothetical questions, not even demands or requests, were met with intense opposition. I was then put under a lot of pressure to retract that and apologise for saying something that is a legitimate thing to think and feel. So I said, okay, so you want me to make sure that we get the bigots and the homophobes to buy their tickets? I think there's something telling in the seemingly good-natured response from director Mark Webb. I'm working for a character that is much bigger than me, whose experience has to be universal in some way, and has to be mythological in a way that transcends personal experience, if that makes sense. I have obligations to a canon and to a character that predate my birth. The idea that universal experiences, that mythological stories, must by their nature be straight, that we have an obligation to a character and a tradition that was forged and born from a period of homophobic censorship, feels like an idea that should be examined at least. Comic book firsts. You could be forgiven for thinking with the code thing, who could blame movie studios for not having queer characters? The comics didn't have them either. The thing is, it's not like the comics haven't given us options since the code was dropped, or even before it came in. Some of them were questionable, by today's understanding of sex and gender, like the Superman stories featuring a character who changed gender in 1940. Wow, trans representation in the 40s? How wonderful! Except for the fact that the ultra-humanite was a scientist who transferred his consciousness to a woman's body to do crime and evade the authorities and seduce others to be um, his minions, which was um, not great. Or what about the first obviously gay character featured in DC in 1987? He was an extremely effeminate man, whose name literally meant strange in Spanish, who told people to call him auntie, and was infected with HIV by a character called the Hemogoblin. So yeah, I can see why the DCEU didn't decide to include him. Jim Shooter, the editor-in-chief of Marvel from 1978 to 1987, allegedly forbade any overt mention of homosexuality amongst its heroes. I'd say allegedly, but like, this was the guy who wrote a comic about Bruce Banner, where gay men tried to sexually assault him in the showers of a YMCA. Shooter said that this was meant to give a realistic, um, you know, portrayal of the horrors of assault, not to provide a homophobic viewpoint, but considering that these nameless men at the YMCA were the first Marvel characters directly identified as queer, um, the story feels pretty damn homophobic to me. We also had some, um, 
missteps in PR, shall we say, like Marvel's editor-in-chief telling a fan who asked about the limited numbers of visibly gay comic book heroes that Freedom Ring was Marvel's leading gay hero, and then it turns out that the next issue, that character was killed off. Um, writer Robert Kirkman now regrets that decision, saying, If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't kill him. I regret it more and more as time goes on. I got rid of, what, 20% of the gay characters at Marvel by killing off this one character? I just never took that stuff into consideration while I was writing. But gradually we did see industry changes coming about. In the 90s we have Constantine's casual remark, girlfriends, the odd boyfriend, they all have the nasty habit of walking out on me. Midnighter and Apollo emerged as two obvious reflections of Batman and Superman, becoming the first out superhero couple in mainstream comics. In 2012, Marvel Comics featured the first same-sex marriage in a superhero comic, when North Star wed his long-term boyfriend. Iceman in 2017 revolves around newly out original X-Men member Iceman as he comes to terms with his sexuality, while doing typical fighting bad guy superhero stuff. In 2017, America Chavez became the first LGBTQ plus person of colour to lead her own ongoing title in the history of Marvel Comics. Coagula in Doom Patrol was the first trans superhero and was created by a trans writer. In DC Bombshells, Batwoman aka Kate Kane was a series lead heroine. As a Jewish American lesbian fighting Nazis, her identity was central to the story. The series also had romantic relationships between Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn and Wonder Woman and Mira. Like the comics are giving superhero movies options. Many fans argue not enough of them, and like scholar Sarah Sentry says, many of these characters are there for only brief arcs before vanishing into obscurity, but they are there to be represented. Movie representation so far. It's worth pointing out that we haven't had no LGBTQ plus representation from Marvel and DC, but it has been extremely limited and relegated to age restricted films for teens and old audiences. Birds of Prey gave us an animated confirmation of bisexual Harley at the beginning of the movie, as well as the openly gay Renee Montoya in the ensemble cast. Deadpool 2 featured a criminally underused Negasonic Teenage Warhead and her girlfriend Yukio as part of its lineup. And more recently, we had The New Mutants, where Wolfsbane and Mirage form a romantic relationship and connection over the course of the movie. But all three of these movies aren't part of the kid friendly cinema blockbuster genre. In terms of the films that do fit that more family oriented rating, the MCU has only had one openly LGBT character in the entirety of its 23 films. And you'd be forgiven for missing him entirely. It was a cameo from straight director Joe Russo playing a gay man in Steve Rogers' support group scene in Endgame, who mentions going on a date with a guy. The character wasn't even named in the scene. It's a bit bleak to be honest. So bleak that I don't know if it's better or worse that there's been alleged instances of them filming queer character confirmations in the MCU before, but then cutting them from the eventual movies. Straight washing. Back in 2017, a leaked scene between Okoye and Io in Black Panther was reported, and it was seen as confirmation of Io's queer identity from the comics also being canon in the MCU. However, the scene didn't make the final cut of the film. This is a particular issue for some viewers because Wakanda is viewed as a kind of pan-African utopia, and the erasure of queerness from that narrative suggests something troubling about the way in which this utopian vision of Wakanda erases or treats queerness, as well as the way that Hollywood itself does. Similarly, Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie and Thor Ragnarok filmed a scene in which an unknown woman leaves her bedroom, confirmation of queerness that was the setup for a potential on-screen romance in a later movie, but again the scene was cut. During the flashback to her battle with Hela, Thompson explains, there was a great shot of me falling back from one of my sisters who's just been slain. In my mind, that was my lover. But an actor's internal interpretation does not representation make. Other queer comic book characters have also had their cinematic counterpart sexuality erased. Mystique in the X-Men universe, Constantine, and Deadpool's pansexuality is limited to tongue-in-cheek jokes, while his main storyline revolves around his only evidence love interest, who's a woman. Wonder Woman in the DCEU talks of men as unnecessary when it comes to pleasure, according to the wisdom of her country, but then Steve very quickly becomes a romantic love interest. To give it a generous reading, we could read between the lines and say that she's bi in a roundabout and unconfirmed way, but it can also be seen as having a bit of a conversion therapy vibe, where all she needed was a good man to show her what she'd been missing. Upcoming LGBTQ plus characters. There are three ways that we can get queer representation in the superhero space. One is creating new heroes and making them queer. The comics did this with the Young Avengers, for example. Two, we can confirm the sexuality of previously queer coded characters. Again, the comics did this with characters like Mystique and Destiny or Wonder Woman. And three, we can queer old superheroes. So take heroes who previously had just been plain old straight and just make them gay for fun. 
The comics did this with Iceman, and this is what Andrew Garfield was suggesting they could do with Spider-Man. There are pros and cons to each of these examples. So, if you make an existing character queer, especially one who hasn't been queer in any other media, some people ask, is that a bit of a cop-out? Shouldn't you create new stories specifically for LGBTQ plus characters? It's a similar argument levelled against films like Ocean's 8. Why does it have to be the lady version of a male franchise? And the counter argument to that is, it would give queer characters a fighting chance because they would have an established audience of fans of that character. Plus it would start to retcon heteronormative history of comics in a way that would start to even out the numbers a bit. Maybe we could have as many diverse superheroes as we do white actors called Chris in the MCU. Comic books have a long history of changing or retconning their characters. They die, get resurrected, have kids, erase their kids, change their backstories. This could be a perfect excuse to add some LGBTQ plus characters to superhero movies. But as Charles Zahn Christensen, president of the queer comic book nonprofit Prism Comics explains, this is very practice that works against queer character creation in the minds of fearful execs. If writer were to launch a story arc that made Spider-Man or Batman gay, they would inevitably become straight again. It's just the way comics work. You're dealing with a community of queer characters in comics that is so small to begin with. All those characters are bearing a burden of representation that is inordinately high compared to their stature in that universe. They have to stay the way they are and grow in number, otherwise it's a step backwards because they're already so underrepresented. You whittle away at it, people are bound to take offense. That's just kind of where we are right now. I would say, controversially maybe, but that doesn't have to be just the way comic book stories work that you can just make a character queer and stick with it. It's not an equal process. The same as whitewashing roles for people of colour, it's not the same as casting a black actor in a traditionally white role. Because even if you did that dozens, hundreds of times over, the sheer weight of presumed white canon across Western literature would still have the majority of characters be white. The same as the majority of characters still being straight, even if we agree to just make a handful of them openly queer. Hope is on the horizon. I mean, it took them long enough, but it is here. Marvel Studios has now said that Valkyrie will be confirmed canonically bisexual in Thor Love and Thunder, and the Eternals will feature not one, but two queer superheroes who are married and raising a child together, and shock horror, they will actually have a kiss on screen. Wild, I know. Plus, as Corey mentioned earlier, the Young Avengers look like they're going to be an actual thing, and considering how queer they are in the comic books, for them not to be equally queer within the adaptation would be, I mean, there would be riots. So as of me filming this, we haven't had like official, official confirmation as to whether Loki is going to be canonically queer within his Marvel TV show that's coming up on Disney Plus. But like, the show is about interplanetary beings, um, the, the lead one of which can like change their appearance at will and is like canonically queer within the comics. So it just feels like if you're gonna take that and then make a show about it and be like, mm, yes, everyone in this show is cis and straight and, uh, you know, if there's any queerness in it, it's just gonna be played for laughs or, or coded. Like, Marvel? <laughs> if you do that, at this point, I'm honestly embarrassed for you. So I hope you enjoyed that deep dive into queer superheroes. Um, as always, we would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. And as I said at the beginning, if you would like to help support me make more videos like this one, I'm gonna leave a link to my Patreon in the description, along with all my social medias, you can find me and Cory all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.